It's the one exception most pro-lifers will accept when it comes to abortion, when the mother's life is threatened. It's a rare occurrence, but today we're going to put real faces on this family crisis when a mother's life hangs in the balance. Stay with us. Michelle Kingsfield is a TV news anchor from Dayton, Ohio. She has two beautiful boys, but the journey to bring her youngest into this world was a struggle. After months of fertility complications, Michelle happily discovered she was pregnant for the second time in 2004. But growing lumps on her neck, increased by the pregnancy, led her to visit the doctor. After seeing several physicians, the consensus was Michelle didn't have cancer. But 12 weeks into her pregnancy, the lumps were rapidly growing, and her doctor decided to do an ultrasound. He said, Michelle, I just have some really bad news for you. He said, you have a rapidly expanding large cell lymphoma. He said, you're going to need chemotherapy right away, and I don't know what it means for your baby. What was I that just, like? And I just started crying, and I just started holding my stomach and crying, my baby, my baby. And I, You know, I think it's a mother's instinct that we think about our children, and, you know, I just had tried so hard to get pregnant with this baby and I just, I thought, this is a death sentence. After multiple tests, Michelle was diagnosed with stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Her doctors were optimistic and gave her a 70% chance of survival, but her baby's future was still unknown. We never really knew what the odds would be of the baby. So, because I was 12 weeks, the perinatologist said, it all depends on your treatment. You may not have to terminate this pregnancy. I don't believe in abortion, and the thought of having to terminate this pregnancy to possibly save my life, I didn't want to have to make that decision. And um, thankfully, in the end, I didn't have to. Michelle immediately began a chemo treatment known as CHOP therapy. Though the treatment was grueling, support from her family and the community helped Michelle through the process. She remained positive and hopeful about her baby's chances of survival. Um, at the time, they told me there were only 275 other women in this country who had had CHOP therapy while they were pregnant. And so they had followed some of them, and the main concerns were just premature delivery, low birth weight, growth restriction. And so I thought, you know what, that's kind of a risk that any parent has. And I thought, you know what, if that's the only risk, I can handle that. And I was just really determined that from the word go, I told my OB, I'm carrying this baby to term. At what point through all of this did you first realize that you were going to survive? I think I'd have to go back to my first chemotherapy. When I sat down and I felt the drugs and I felt like I had something that was combating it. I felt really good. And, but at that time, I still had this huge neck. And two weeks later, my neck was like it is now. And that's when I knew. I remember always doing stories and talking to people and always hearing from doctors that this positive attitude when you're sick really helps. And so I would always say, you know, I'm carrying this baby to term. This baby's going to be fine. I'm going to be okay. Everything's going to be great. And then I remember thinking to myself sometimes, who are you kidding? You are lying to yourself. You are lying to everybody else to be so positive. But I knew that my other direction or the other road led nowhere. So I just kept saying it, believing it. And when I hit about 35 weeks, I thought, it's all good. On April 27, 2005, after enduring six rounds of chemo, Michelle delivered a baby boy named Robert. The day was an emotional one and a testament to her faith that she and Robert would survive. There's not a day that goes by that I don't look at him and think to myself, wow, you almost weren't here. And he's just such a charismatic boy and he's so full of life and such a talker and he's funny and he's unreal at the same time and he's just amazing. Every child is such a gift and he's just a double miracle to me. At what point in your life did they tell you, Michelle, you're cancer free? 
he was born in April, and so in May, um, right around Memorial Day, I had the PET scan, and they called me that afternoon and said I was cancer-free. In September 2010, Clint Council and his wife Jessica were already the parents of a boy named Aiden when Jessica found out she was pregnant with her second child. But their happiness was soon derailed when Jessica complained of a sore throat. After two months of doctor visits and misdiagnoses, Jessica woke up unable to breathe and was rushed to the ER. In late November, she was diagnosed with a rare form of throat cancer. I sat down with Clint and Jessica's mother, Kathy, surrounded by the sight and sound of medical equipment to hear their story. What were your reactions, both of you, when you found out that horrific news? I was a basket case. No. That's all I can say. Pure and simple, yeah. Understandable. Oh, when I first found out, I guess I didn't really believe it. In fact, I couldn't make myself say the word cancer. I'm a very optimistic person, so I always think the better, you know, the best. And uh, my daughter was a tremendous inspiration to me. She was just the strongest woman I've ever known. I admired her and I told her, I said, you're a much stronger woman that I could, of course she was always no, she was nothing, you know, she just thought she was just, but she was amazing. And it wasn't her, I mean, it was God's grace, that's what you saw. It was just His grace that anytime anybody came in that room, she always had a smile on her face. I don't care how tired she was. And that helped me, you know, to just see how she handled it so well. Clint, when you finally got a lay of the land with her cancer, what was the game plan of the physicians? Uh, the oncologist um, who saw her two days after we came into the hospital um, suggested chemo. Uh, she said, quote, they're the two nastiest chemos that are out there. You will lose the baby. And um, she said there's a 15% chance they'll work because Jessica had one of the most aggressive cancers you can have. So uh, it didn't take Jessica long to tell them no. Was there any time that you actually considered opting for an abortion? Oh, an abortion, absolutely not. She could never have lived with herself because there would have always been that nagging in the back of her mind. What if I, I, what if I didn't honor God? What if I, uh, I disappointed him? What if um, he would have let both of us live had I chosen to uh, not have the abortion? There would have always been that nagging in the back of her mind. I understood completely. I wouldn't have wanted her to do any other thing. Like he said, she would have died had she harmed that baby. I mean, I would have given anything if it had been me. But I was so proud of her. And I'm still proud of her because she lived out what she believed. And that baby came first. On the evening of February 5, Jessica complained of a headache and slipped into a coma. The next morning, doctors chose to deliver Jessica's baby. Little Jessie was born weighing only one pound, three ounces. If she fell asleep at nine o'clock that night, Jessie was taken out uh, at five o'clock the next day. Technically, she was born at 25 weeks, but when she was taken out, the doctor said, oh, she's not 25 weeks. <laughs> she's more like 23 and a half to 24 weeks. And uh, so they intubated her, uh, put a tube down her throat to help her breathe. But um, she was surprisingly well off for being as small and as young as she was. When Jessica got to January 22nd, all the doctors were on board with getting the baby here. All of them. Radiologists and oncologists included. Uh, they were shocked. They, beyond words, they could not believe she got. And we had doctors come into the room just weeping, crying, breaking down. One year later, baby Jessie is doing very well. She can't yet eat on her own and is still on a ventilator. 
but the doctors hope to take it out very soon, and the prognosis for her future looks better every day. Clint, what was it like to see her for the first time? I was in the delivery room. I knew that my wife was already gone by that point, but um, to see her for the first time was very, very mixed emotionally. Um, that's such a hard question to answer, um, just because I knew that my nickname for her is bought with a price, because the price that I paid for her was very dear. Um, but that's okay. Dr. Elise Cardonic is a high-risk obstetrician who has taken a special interest in cases involving cancer during pregnancy. Dr. Cardonic found there was very limited research and documentation when it came to this issue. So in 1997, she started the Cancer and Pregnancy Registry to collect cases of women fighting cancer during pregnancy and to monitor the effects treatment had on the women and their babies. How common is a diagnosis of cancer during pregnancy? Well, the literature says that it occurs about one in a thousand pregnancies on average. But we know there's a trend in this country for women to delay their pregnancies to older ages. So, especially in a high-risk practice, the majority of my patients are in their late 30s. So the trend will probably increase and the newer literature may show that it's a little more common than what we previously thought. Dr. Cardonic, tell me about the Cancer and Pregnancy Registry that you've put together. I realized that it had to be somewhat of a liaison between the surgeons or the oncologist and the OB, what is safe in pregnancy for patients who have cancer. Maybe each OBGYN or each oncologist may only see one or two patients in a whole career. The patient herself feels like the only one going through cancer when it should otherwise be a happy time in her pregnancy. But if I were able to say to her, we've also treated 24 patients for Hodgkin's disease, or a breast cancer patient, we've followed 160 people with breast cancer throughout the country, it's more reassuring for that one woman to go through treatment or surgery than feeling like she's the only one who's dealing with this at this time. Are there any trends that you've seen as a result of this information? We see that the babies do much better than expected. We don't have more than five people in the registry who've received chemotherapy in the first trimester. We try to delay chemotherapy to the second and third trimester. One of the trends that we saw that really didn't change was the recommendation to terminate a pregnancy. So that is still about 20% of uh, physicians will recommend to terminate a pregnancy with the diagnosis of cancer. Is it full-blown treatment, chemo treatment for cancer during the first trimester, is it 100% fatal for the baby? I mean, what... I wouldn't say that it's fatal, but when you look at multiple agents, very rarely is cancer treated with just one agent. So when you look at multiple agents, there was a study that said there's about a 66% malformation rate. It's just that if you're, if you're doing it with a knowledge that she's pregnant and you know the organs are developing, you should try to avoid multi-agent chemotherapy in the first trimester. And most of the time you can buy time by doing the surgery first. Are there any other concerns for that unborn baby due to chemotherapy in the womb? There are some studies that show that chemotherapy will lead to lower birth weight. As far as medical outcomes for the baby, we've seen that they're comparable to either other babies born at the same preterm gestational age if they happen to be preterm or other babies who weren't exposed to chemotherapy. When I sat down with Clint, it was the day after the first anniversary of Jessica's death. Clint and Jessica's son, Aiden, had an extremely hard time coping during the first few months, but each day is getting better. Kathy and Jessica's dad, Ken, moved in next door to help with Aiden and Jesse. Ken's still deeply affected by the loss of his daughter, but the family continues to cope and seeing Jesse is a comforting reminder of Jessica's selfless sacrifice. How do you cope from day to day when you have those difficult days as you did this week when it was the anniversary of, of Jessica's death? What keeps you going? Uh, being a dad? <laughs> um, I, I don't have a choice but to stay um, and to take care of my kids. There's a study that says one in 1,000 pregnant women is diagnosed with cancer. Now there's a growing amount of data that shows that, that they can be successfully treated. Healthy births are, are more possible now, but still it appears that about 20% of the physicians suggest abortion. Why do you think that is? It's simply a sign of our society. Um, the, the lack of the 
care for life, the lack of the respect for it, um, absolutely floors me. I think they're uneducated. I think that they truly don't know. Um, and I think a lot of it is fear. Um, my OB had never had a patient who was pregnant with cancer. But the first thing she said is, I'll help you through this. We'll get you the best doctors. We know the best perinatologist in town. Um, and unfortunately, not every doctor is well versed on that. Michelle, did you ever consider an abortion? Um, I did consider terminating the pregnancy early on when everything was unclear. So, um, yeah, at, at the beginning, my thought was, gosh, what if keeping this child and continuing my pregnancy meant it was going to be 20% less chance for me to survive? I kind of thought, all right, well, I already have a two-year-old. I already have a husband. They need me. And so it crossed my mind. I thought, I'm going to probably have to terminate this pregnancy. But I hadn't talked to the specialist. I didn't know what my treatment was at that time. I didn't know what the odds were. I didn't know what the complications were. Once that was all mapped out for me, I just thought, oh, this is just such a no-brainer to me. Um, it can be done.